morning. I'm Jacob Leffler, one of the neurology PGY4s. Um, I'm going to talk about the NSC project that I started earlier this year, and I'll be continuing um, into fellowship in neuroimmunology here. Um, and this um, was in the Robinson lab. My mentor was Bill Robinson, who heads up the immunology rheumatology division. So the outline for today, three things I'm going to talk about. The Epstein-Barr virus hypothesis and MS autoimmunity, an approach that um, our, our, our method to try to identify rare EBV positive B cells from patients with MS. Lastly, I'll talk about some preliminary findings, um, some challenges, some future directions. So the EBV hypothesis, um, my main takeaway on this first is just a little overview of EBV biology and just the main take home message is that EBV biology is very um, intertwined with normal B cell biology. So starting with the EBV, it uses a complement receptor that's found on naive B cells to invade the B cell. Um, that receptor is known as CD21. Once it establishes, um, you know, establishes itself in the B cell, it enters what we call latency, uh, like life cycle latency phase. And in this phase, there's only a few proteins and RNAs that are expressed. Um, and these uh, are pretty interesting because they uh, mimic a lot of the normal B cell physiology. So on the cell surface, there's proteins LMP1, LMP2. These are called latent mem membrane proteins and they subsume normal B cell receptor functioning. So they sort of provide the normal B cell um, phosphorylation cascade signaling that would be needed to promote B cell survival. Um, and then the other proteins that are expressed are called EBNAs. These are nuclear antigens, and they help regulate the transcription of the EBV genes. In this latency phase, things are pretty quiet. The EBV is not doing too much. It's just sort of hanging out, surviving, um, promoting B cell survival. And then at some point, the um, virus enters into a lytic stage. Here you get sort of an explosion in viral um, protein expression, um, you know, generation of new virus, uh, viral particles and um, spread of virus to other B cells. The evidence for EBV triggering MS um, has been controversial for a long time, but back in 2022, like two big articles came out, one in Science, one in Nature, um, and I, they also have been described and sort of discussed at Grand Rounds in the past. I just point out this was from one of the articles um, from Science, and it shows some epidemiologic data from military recruits. And it showed that, you know, zero conversion to EBV carried a much higher risk of developing MS um, than if you never zero converted. What's interesting is that they also took all the serological samples they had and they ran them on um, peptide arrays of all known viruses known to infect humans. And they looked at, you know, for people that developed MS and people that didn't, which viral peptides um, were the serology samples more reactive to. By far and away, um, there was the greatest number of peptides that were reactive in EBV-related peptides. Um, and that wasn't true for any other virus known to infect humans. At the same time, um, work in the Robinson lab and Tobias Lanz, who has now has his own lab here at Stanford, really laid out in like really nice detail a lot of a series of experiments describing um, molecular mimicry between one of those viral proteins I mentioned, EBNA1, and a normal human CNS protein called gliocam, which is a structural protein found in the brain and the spinal cord. So we have this sort of model now of how we think EBV triggers MS. Um, and it starts with uh, a B cell recognizing EBNA1 from a, a viral, um, uh, from, from the virus. That leads to B cell activation. The normal process of somatic hypermutation where that B cell receptor undergoes an evolutionary process and it becomes more affinity, uh, has more affinity for EBNA1. And in the process, it also develops high affinity for the normal antigen um, gliocam. And in that process, you now have an autoreactive B cell, or you started with an initial B cell that wasn't autoreactive. Some questions here is, is EBV responsible only for triggering the disease, or does it also propagate the disease over time? That's an open question. Part of our question with that is, are these, EBV, are these B cells that are autoreactive, do they, are they themselves EBV positive, and is EBV promoting their survival when really they shouldn't be surviving because they're autoimmune, they should be... Um, being eliminated through normal processes of um, cell to or self tolerance. A, a big sort of gap in the field has actually been identifying these rare EBV positive B cells. <clears throat> a lot of the literature on EBV 
biology comes from other indirect methods or from the onco oncology literature, but it's been really hard to actually identify these EBV positive B cells in patients with autoimmune conditions. So this was the project that I joined um, that was um, sort of being spearheaded by uh, postdoc in the lab, Shadi Yunus. And this is using a single cell sequencing approach to try to identify these EBV positive B cells. We start with blood from patients with MS or without MS, maybe other autoimmune conditions. Um, we isolate out the B cells and we use um, what's called like a microfluidics approach where the idea is, I don't know if I have a pointer here. The idea is that you have cells, you run them through a, a microscopic channel and then you tag those cells with DNA barcodes. Um, and that way when you sequence the cells, you can put back the pieces and see where those gene transcripts came from uh, originally. So the idea is that you'll, you know, sort of run autoreactive B cells. You'll get some information about gene expression. Um, that's known as single cell RNA seq data. We also use a, um, a similar technique called site seq, where we're going to tag surface markers on the B cell with other DNA barcodes. So now we're not just going to get information about the genes that are expressed. We're going to get information about what's going on with the cell surface so that we can really definitively, you know, phenotype the B cells um, at the same time. And then lastly, you can get some sequencing data about the B cell receptor itself, which you can use to get some information about the lineage of the B cells and, um, and so forth. So some preliminary findings. So in the time, the six months, I was able to run about six samples, um, but I've only finished analysis for one. So this is that uh, first patient uh, data. So what you're seeing here is one of the typical types of uh, single cell RNA sequencing plots. It's called the UMAP plot. The idea here is that every uh, dot on the plot is a cell and dots that are closer together are cells that are more similar in their gene expression profile. Cells that are dots that are further apart are, are less similar. Um, this on its own is not super helpful for our question, but using that other information, like the site seek information, we can start to ask, you know, what types of B cells are present? In this case, um, this is showing highlighting cells that have higher expression of CD27, which is a marker of memory B cells. And this is thought to be where EBV probably um, resides within the B cell population. Unfortunately, in this sample, um, we didn't see EBV viral transcripts. So didn't really get a positive result on this first sample. So some next steps, a um, few issues. One might be that we're just starting with too few B cells. Um, there's a lot of processing. We lose a lot of samples along the way. So part of that's just starting with higher volume blood samples. Um, the second is maybe a biological reason, which is perhaps the EBV B cells are primarily in the CSF and not in the blood. So we're starting to run CSF in addition to blood. Um, and then lastly, is that maybe it's disease activity dependent. So maybe it's only when someone is actively flaring that we're really going to be able to capture these rare cells in the moment. And maybe when the person's in remission, it's relatively quiescent and these are become more rare. Um, so those are all sort of next steps that I'm looking forward to working on during my fellowship here. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Bill Robinson in the Robinson Lab, Shadi Yunus, the postdoc who I um, joined on this project. Um, Tobias Lanz here for fielding questions about EBV and glial cam, Larry Simon for connecting me to the Robinson Lab, the NST group, and Project Big for sort of collaborating, um, helping provide some, um, you know, assistance with patient samples and also helping me, you know, um, with grant writing and fellowship, uh, sort of securing fellowship here for the next three years. So I will stop there. Thanks.